So, the uh, following program is brought to you by Haymarket Books. And uh, at a time like this, radical ideas are obviously needed more than ever. And um, Haymarket, uh, as well as producing uh, these virtual events, brings out books by Arundhati Roy, Kianga Yamada Taylor, Angela Davis, Naomi Klein, uh, and many other wonderful writers. And uh, if you're moved by any of the program that you're about to see, you can support the work of Haymarket by uh, buying their books from their own website. And even better, you can join the Haymarket Book Club. Welcome, and thanks to everybody for joining us today from around the world. Uh, there are countries and cities that I could name right now of folks who are getting on the line. Really appreciate you being here. Uh, just so you know who I am, I am not a relief pitcher from the 1985 Houston Astros, even though my hair has gotten long in Corona land and is going out over the ears like it never has in my entire life. My name is Dave Zyron, and I'm the sports editor at The Nation magazine. And before I introduce the man of the hour, Scoop Jackson, uh, I got a little bit of housekeeping. I want to thank the organizer and sponsors of this teach-in, Haymarket Books. Haymarket is the publisher of a number of vital books by radical thinkers, such as Scoop Jackson, Arundhati Roy, Kianga Yamada Taylor, Angela Davis, Naomi Klein, and so many others. We need bold, radical ideas right now, and it is critical we support independent publishers and bookstores, and you can do this in three ways. One by buying books from Haymarket, two, by joining the Haymarket Books Book Club, and three, if you're in position to make a donation, no matter how small, via Venmo, there will be a card on screen about how to do this, and folks posting that information in the YouTube chat as well. This video will be recorded and shared afterwards on the Haymarket Books YouTube channel. Please subscribe to this channel, like this video now, and share it with as many people as possible. And please consider following Haymarket on their social media channels and signing up for their newsletter. Haymarket has more important live stream events lined up that I hope you can join, including on May 19th, Abolish ICE is not just a slogan, immigrant justice in the age of coronavirus with John Washington and Justin Akers' Chacon among other great events. You can find these and other Haymarket events at the Haymarket Book YouTube channel. And just a little bit more housekeeping, real quick. With so many people joining this call, we may need your forbearance if we have any technical issues. If your stream gets choppy, it might help to reduce your image quality. Folks will give instructions on how to do so in the chat. If our YouTube feed is interrupted for any reason, you may need to navigate back to the YouTube Haymarket Books page. The feed should resume there in case of interruption. This video will be recorded and shared afterwards on the Haymarket Books YouTube channel as well. We will have time for Q&A. And Scoop is great on the Q&A, so please, and I'll answer any questions if you got them as well. Uh, so please post your questions on the live video feed wherever you're watching it. If that's on the Haymarket YouTube or Facebook, just comment on the stream. On Twitter, just post a reaction directly on the video. And uh, hey, we got the Haymarket books. We got it up live right now on the Twitters. I am retweeting it right now so people can jump on because I'm like that. And now it's my pleasure to bring in, I call him the coal train of the sports page. I trend, he's wearing a coal train shirt. I've been calling him the coal train of the sports page for over 10 years. I tried to make it catch on as a thing, 
because when I used to read Scoop on the New York City subway, reading my Slam magazine, I always thought his writing was like jazz. And so I called him the Coltrane of the sports page before I even knew that he was a flesh and blood person and not just a, a figure behind these terrific articles. He is, the he is a national senior writer for ESPN. He has covered issues of race, culture, and sports for various publications over 25 years, former executive editor at Slam Magazine, former publisher of The Agenda, and author of this book, which I absolutely love. And it's called The Game Is Not a Game, The Power, Protest, and Politics of American Sports. Can't recommend it highly enough. His name is Scoop Jackson. Scoop, how you doing, sir? I'm good, well, man. I appreciate this. This is an honor, man. They don't. I don't know if everybody knows how far we go back, you know, and how much love I think we go for one another. But you know, we are brothers from different mothers, so you know, this is um, this is big for me. So I appreciate it. Thank you. I got to show everybody my hat, and I want you yeah. to show everybody and explain uh the poster behind you first. This hat of mine, I got to show people this. This was uh, from another Haymarket author, is John Carlos from the 1968 Olympics, raised his fist on the medal stand. He gave me this hat. You see it's a fist with the Olympic colors, and that's his shadow in there. And then look at this cool part. Flip it up. A little artwork of John Carlos, Tommy Smith, and the Australian runner, Peter Norman. So just showing off my hat for everybody. Um, can you show me? I'll flex it I'll flex in a different way is that Behind me is a portrait in my office of Ali that I commissioned for my man Moses Ball to do for me uh, upon Ali's passing. And um, actually, it's the, we, the portrait was supposed to be with a white backdrop because I was putting it on a white wall. But he surprised me when he sent it to me. And it was a, a piece we did on Sports Center that I did on Sports Center about Ali, an honorarium of, uh, of him and his legacy. And he actually like took the script from that piece and put it in the backdrop of the uh, of the painting. So it's a it's a one of one that I'm very very um you know you know it mean, it means a lot to me and I, it's it's the centerpiece of my office in Chicago. So you know it's beautiful. And I want to ask you about Muhammad Ali in just a second. But first, I, I want to introduce you to a lot of the people tuning in from around the country and around the world who may not necessarily know about you and your background because I find it absolutely fascinating. Can you tell folks about about how, how you came up, about your parents, about their politics, their commitment, and how that translated into your life? Yeah, no problem. My, um, my mother and father were both uh, members of the Black Panther Party. Um, my father probably more on the low than my mother because he was a newspaper journalist. He was the first black newspaper reporter uh, in, in Chicago, one of the first 10 in the country. And my mother was a social worker. But she was also a, you know, uh, a public activist. So, you know, back in the day in the 60s, and I was born in 63, you know, they were both contributing members to the party. So I was raised under that auspice. You know, mm -hmm. I was raised under that mentality. Um, and, you know, that, that kind of came with it from everything I've, I've done. That, that's kind of been my foundation. Not necessarily the Panther Party, but that that mode of thinking of black self-esteem. Um, and not only that, you know, I add in there that you know, I've li I live in an area called South Shore in Chicago. And I've always lived in South Shore. Like we still my wife and I, my wife is from South Shore. Well, we both were raised in South Shore and we both come from South Shore. And we since we've been together for 26 years, married longer than that together. We've always, South Shore has always been, we've never left South Shore. And inside of South Shore is where Elijah Muhammad built the mosque where the Nation of Islam is. So I came up like blocks away from the mosque. So, and with my mother, you know, and father not necessarily being, you know, claiming any certain religion, not only, you know, growing up in a household that was, was rooted in Black Panther ideology, we grew up from a religious standpoint of following the word and what was going on, not necessarily religiously, but also culturally down the street with the nation of Islam. So wow. there, there's, there's roots of black empowerment um, and black entrepreneurship and do for yourself or die a slave uh, mentality that exists through me and I've, through my career, tried to find a way to navigate using that 
as not necessarily a, a lead, but as a balance. Mm -hmm. if that makes any sense at all. No, it does. And because I mean, anybody who reads this book will see it like it's run through uh, with the idea of not just black pride, but this idea of black empowerment uh, and using sports as a platform as an anti-racist platform. I mean, frankly, as it should be, given uh, the fact that without black labor, without black bodies, you don't have this multi-billion dollar athletic industrial complex. And I think we need to be reminded of that more than we are. Yeah, and I think we're in a situation right now where we have to be reminded. And, you know, my thing as a writer is to just look at it through that prism. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think sometimes we, we get shifted away from that because the power of black athletes in America has risen to a level where that we almost forget that as powerful as black athletes have become collectively, they still don't hold the power mm -hmm. of sports. And with me tending to look at the cultural and business side, not just the performance side, but the cultural and business side of sports and the power it does has, have, there's a prism that lends itself for you to always distinctively understand the role race plays in that. Mm -hmm. And I, I try to kind of consolidate that prism in the 13 chapters. Yeah, and, and you do it, uh, which is what's so impressive. You know, when you say that about this appearance of power without the actuality of power, it really does make me think about uh, the news, some of the news today with the National Football League, like they're, they're going to have a big three hour special on ESPN where they're going to unveil the schedule. The NFL is talking as if, you know, coronavirus is just a distraction or dust on their shoulder. Right. And they're going full steam ahead uh, with this fall going forward with the games this fall. And it makes me think about like the lack of power of the black athlete in this particular scenario, because it's like typical career only lasts three years. Contracts aren't guaranteed. And NFL ownership, they need these games played for them to get billions of dollars in broadcast funds. And the athletes themselves are in a position where it's like play, where frankly, a lot of American workers are in this position right now where it's like play or go home, work or go right. home. Right. There are, of course, no black owners in the NFL. Uh, Michael Bennett. Uh, said to me once that uh, he and his brother Martellus, you know, two very, very conscious uh, former and current NFL players, the Bennett brothers, that NFL stands for either not for long or uh, N-word for lease. Yeah, like, right, like, right, right, only right. Only on a temporary basis. So I see that and I see the importance for what you bring to the table to be part of our sports dialogue. It's interesting you say it, the, the way you view that and it made you look at that dynamic as far as, you know, you know, black players and the power they don't have. I immediately thought about the lack of black executives. Yeah. I almost like I put the players aside and like, you know what? There's nobody in the NFL, you know, in position to even further this conversation to say, hey, let's not do this because of this. Um, and and I wasn't even thinking of the ownership situation because of course there are no black owners, but you know, just from the executive standpoint, somebody to use the proverbial term with the seat at the table, you know, and not serving the table, you right. know, that can actually sit down as an equal or a partner or a voice or voices to say to the, you know, the NFL owners and the commissioner and all the other exec executives in that business mode or in that, you know, in that business model that we call, you know, the NFL, hey, you know what? We need to at least think about this because this is how it's going to affect this. Can we rethink this? Can we not treat this virus as an aside? Right. Because, you know, maybe you got somebody in the room that's looking for the societal effect that this will have or the societal role it will play in others making decisions. So it's not just the NFL putting out a schedule doing this back. It's, it's, it's the impact that the NFL has and how people connect with that and how to react to what the NFL does. Right. And without having any executives or anybody of power, real true, true executive power within the NFL, you know, think tank to further that discussion or push that agenda, at least to the table. So 
there may be some hesitancy in putting out a schedule or doing what they're doing or moving forward the way they move forward. It'd be good, but my 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 mind went straight. It didn't even go to the athlete, Dave. It went straight to the fact that we have no black executives or executives of color who are connected to the situation we're in in a much different way than rich white men to at least make them think about something differently. Yeah, and what you're saying strikes to the heart of when and how sports are going to reopen because this president put together his reopened sports committee and his committee is it, it, it would be shocking if we haven't been living through this for four years, but it's uh, all the male sports commissioners for the men's sports. And it's a group of owners like his buddies. It's Jerry Jones, owner of the Cowboys, Robert yeah. Kraft, owner of the Patriots, uh, Mark Cuban, owner of the Mavericks. And it's unbelievable. Like it's a committee about reopening sports and there's no health experts on it. There's no black people on it. There's no women on it. I mean, given how diverse the field of play is, you actually have to go consciously make that effort to create something that looks like a country club. Yeah. Talking about how sports are going to reopen. Well, you know what I'll say, Dave, throughout this whole thing, man, and this is not just specifically directed at sports, just in general. And looking at the people that are in control of making decisions of what we do as a nation. As a black person, I've said, man, this is a bad time not to trust white people. Yeah. <laughs> Because, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'm serious. If you look at the governors, if you look yeah. at the people in administration in the White House, if you look at the scientists, man, you know what I'm saying? If if, if you're a black conspiracy theorist, or if, you, if you're, you know, minority who doesn't trust white males, this is a bad time not to trust them, man, because uh, everything that's happening is in their hands. <laughs> everything. It, it's something, though. I mean, any small d democracy has to be built on a sense of trust and accountability. Exactly. And to have an absence of trust and accountability, which we just do not have in this country, is trust or accountability, makes a time like now all the more dangerous. And it's part of the explanation for why this country is in the place that it's in. But before before we go on that, that, that tangent, I'm so <laughs> sorry. I got off topic because I wanted to ask you very specifically about your thought, like we call this from Ali to LeBron, the long road to freedom or something like, and I, yeah. I wanted to ask you some, get into some history a little bit and wanted to know when you were first conscious of the person behind you, Muhammad Ali, and what his influence perhaps meant to you. Really day one. I, I can't remember a time in my life when it was, not I was born in 1963. So, um, and like I explained my parents, you know, um, affiliation, with, you know, black social movements, you know, particularly Black Panther Party and, you know, Operation Push with Operation Bread Basket. I was a child of that uh, with Jesse Jackson back in the day um, and the importance of King, you know, and, you know, the sports connection to John and Tom, you know, and the Olympics and, you know, the whole movement that was going on within our, uh, within our, you know, society. Um, Ali, I, like I said, I can't remember a time ever not having that man's name, his presence, and his practice being a part of my life and being at the forefront you know, of our lives, of, of an example of what black pride exemplified, you know, the, and more importantly, the way you should feel about yourself. Right. Um, I'll never forget the first column I wrote for ESPN I can't remember the exact line, but I put in there something I've always believed is that Muhammad Ali is more important than Jackie Robinson. And a lot of people took didn't get that. But Jackie Robinson did break a color barrier and he opened up the doors for black individuals to, you know, just become a part of different facets of society, not just sports. But in business and in you know all other walks of life, but there's something different about there's something different about someone who makes an entire race feel about themselves, and to me that goes much further than being able to almost be accepted by somebody else. You don't need somebody's approval to feel a certain way about yourself, and Ali made us feel a way about ourselves that no other 
athlete mm-hmm. or nobody on that on that type of global stage had ever done before. So once again, me coming up blocks away from the mosque, you know, and my parents being who they were and our, you know, black society being what it was for the most part, you know, Ali was, you know, he had, he had, you know, almost religious status, Mm -hmm. you know, and I really, there's no way I could pinpoint without it because what year did he fight Liston? Uh, 64. 64. Okay. Right. 64. I was born in 63. Mm Mm-hmm. You understand what I'm saying? So your whole life. I, I very vaguely, I don't even remember Cassius Clay. Cassius Clay was stories to me. You know, a year after I was born, you know, less than a year after I was born, he's Muhammad Ali. Mm. You know, and, and and a small, you know, quote unquote church, you know, <laughs> that was down the street from where I was living became the center of a global religion. Mm -hmm. So I was at the foot of all of that happening from one years old. So to answer your question, there's never been a time in my life where I can even go back to thinking where he wasn't, he didn't play a role. So, so Ali sets down a marker that says you have to be about something more than sports. Uh, And, and if you got to, if you have a platform, you got to use it for something bigger than sports. Uh, do you see people like LeBron James? Do you think, like, let's go specifically to LeBron. Uh, do you see LeBron being as a part of that tradition? Or do you think LeBron is part of something else? Is LeBron part of what Ali built? Or does he build his own thing? Like, wh- where do you see LeBron in that continuum? I think LeBron has built his own thing, without question. I think LeBron has used... Um, He's used the context of the culture we're in to specifically reach audiences and make moves and send messages that wouldn't have worked 50 years ago, you know, because of various reasons. So he's been very strategic about how he's gone along and moved things. Um, So I think he's done his own thing. But I also think that there is a spirit there that had Ali not existed, LeBron would have made moves differently. I, I think LeBron is very grounded in what Ali stood for, you know, and what Ali, you know, without actually saying those words, being more than an athlete meant. And he carries that with him, but he carries it very smartly and not recklessly. Right. You know, but at the same time, I'm not one of those individuals that looks at LeBron and expects him to be the next Ali. I'm not the one who looks at Michael Jordan and expects him to be the next Ali. I'm not the one that looks at Serena Williams and say, you need to be the next Ali. I understand that this man is unique in a way that we may never see him again. The same way Malcolm X was unique in a way we ne- may never see him again. The same way Martin Luther King was unique in a way we've never seen him, we may never see him again. Nelson Mandela, unique in a way we may never see him again. Gandhi, you know, we could go down the line of individuals that we would never see again. I think Muhammad Ali is in that, you know, realm of conversation where we can include him in that and not put that on other athletes that, you know, they need to be at his level or be him in order to have, you know, a social, political, racial, economic impact. That's that's not healthy thinking, Mm -hmm. especially from us being minorities. Mm-hmm. You know, we have this thing, and I was talking to Bamani, uh, Bamani Jones about this the other day on the show, is that we as black people, especially when it comes to sports, you know, and, 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 and parts of movement forward of our culture, we have this thing about looking and searching for absolute blackness that almost becomes harmful. Like we want all of our black heroes to not just wear capes, but they can't have flaws. They have to do everything. And... Human beings don't function that way. It's Mm. not like Ali is flawless. It's not like LeBron is flawless. It's not like Steph Curry, Serena, Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods. You know, we can find flaws in black athletes. We can find flaws in black politicians. We can find flaws in black activists. We can find find flaws down the line. Our problem is we start to nitpick Mm -hmm. on LeBron doing everything 
Why does LeBron have to do everything? Why does he have to be perfect in order to be important? You know, let him do his thing and we'll take that. As long as he's not doing any harm, we can't expect him to do everything. You know, and I think we get caught up in a, in a lot of that. And I try to not be a part of that. But I say that all to say is that I believe Ali did things on such a level that we almost think he was flawless and, you know, never made any mistakes and was and was the epitome of absolute blackness and hold everybody else to what he did. And there may not be another one of him and, and, and that becomes a problem. Yeah, there, there's this uh, great quote by, by Ken Burns, uh, the great documentary filmmaker. I'm going to get it wrong, but he said, you know, the Greeks understood that heroes had flaws, that gods had flaws. And, exactly. you know, and, it, and it's like it's a very specific part of our modern culture where we put, you know, it's like we put people on pedestals and then there's a whole other kind of uh, process of then trying to tear them down. Exactly. And instead of recognizing that, you know, part of what makes somebody a hero is how they negotiate the positive and negative parts of their character and the war that is then enlisted as those two parts of their character go into combat with one another. And and that's one of the places where I think Ali, one of the things that what makes him his hero is not that he was perfect, but, you know, when it came time to stand up, he made the decision to be 12 feet tall when yes. he didn't have to. Yes, exactly. And, and we should honor that, but at the same time, we shouldn't put that burden on somebody else. Exactly. Once, that's, what, that's what separates people right. That, that's what makes him special. If we think everybody's going to be like that, then that means that he's not that special. It's almost yeah. like and I don't want to like take away from the importance of this, but that's if we're talking about entertainers and singer, like, OK, Michael Jackson is here and Stevie Wonder is here and everybody else has to be like that. <laughs> that's impossible. You know, every now and then we get those individuals that do things on a level that the average or even the super human people cannot do. But that's what separates them you know, from everybody else and to put the expectation on those that we consider great or carrying greatness within them. I, I, I just think at some point that's wrong. Doesn't help us. Yeah, it doesn't help. That's, I won't say it's wrong, Davey. Exactly. It doesn't help us. I'm not saying it's wrong, but it doesn't help us. And as black individuals, we don't have the luxury of having so many heroes. We only get a few heroes <laughs> at a time. So we need to be very careful about like bringing those heroes down or, you know, trying to make them, you know, right. bound up to a level, an impossible level, because there's only few that come, you know, well, you, know, you know, there's only a few to get accepted. I put it that way. Yeah. And I mentioned LeBron in the first place and about being in that tradition because of a tweet. I mean, again, one of those things he did not have to do, but a tweet he sent out just the other day that's gotten a lot of uh, play. It's got, I mean, tremendous amount, amount of publicity where he was speaking about the case of um, Ahmad Arbery, yeah, uh, yeah. the young man in Brunswick, Georgia, who in uh, February was hunted down uh, by a former police officer and his son, white former police officer and his son, in a case that has so many echoes of the Trayvon Martin case, I can't even say. And this is what LeBron sent out. He said, we're literally hunted every day, every time we step foot outside the comfort of our homes. Can't even go for a damn jog, man. Like, WTF, man, are you kidding me? No, are you kidding me? I'm sorry, Ahmad. Rest in paradise and my prayers and blessings sent to you, Ahmad Arbery. What does that do? I have my own theories about this, and I'm happy to share them. But what to you, what does that do when someone like LeBron James actually notices an injustice like this and amplifies it? What does that do? Does it do anything? Am I overthinking that it actually makes an impact? What do you well, think? Well, I, I, I think his words resonate, you know, and I think his actions resonate, and I think his sentiments, you know, resonate. So, once again, we didn't have Twitter 40 years ago. So, yes. to have um, uh, an outlet where you can voice unfilteredly how you feel about certain things without having to call a press conference. Without having to have people around you, without worrying about how your message is going to be broadcast globally. You know, you have the power to make statements about how you feel about certain things. You know, and LeBron has used that, I think, masterfully. This is how he feels. And I think, you know, 
there's a large part of people that don't feel that. Well, I think a large part of people that understand that feeling, but don't agree with him having that feeling. Mm. You know, and for the fact that I put it this way, that LeBron understands that there are going to be a section or sections of society globally that understands him feeling that way, but he should not publicly convey him feeling that way, but he still does it. You know what I'm saying? Says a lot about him and what now, I'm not going to say he's willing to risk, but how important I think he feels that it is to have his voice out there to support other voices that aren't like his, that feel the same way that he does. And I think he understands that there are a lot of people, you may be included, I may be included, you know, our family members and other people, we don't even know random people, you know, they, they, their people are putting out petitions to get, you know, signed to try to find, and it's a day, day, that's a whole nother thing. The fact that we have to send out petitions to yeah. try to get, you know, these two individuals arrested for murder. The fact that we have to put out, it's, it's a whole nother story. Yeah. But LeBron putting out a tweet like that for people that have felt that way and publicly use Twitter, use Facebook, use Instagram, use all type of social medias to put their own messages out there. What LeBron does in his tweet just validates their feelings. That helps. And I, I hope that it can even play a small role in what well, I call it puncturing privilege about you got white people who are fans of LeBron, but have the privilege to not care about Ahmaud Arbery. And maybe if LeBron says something, it can puncture that privilege and they actually have to be confronted with the reality of Ahmaud Arbery's life and the reality of justice in this country or absence of justice. Here's the thing, I agree with you, but here's why I think that hope is gonna fall on deaf ears and on non-movement from the white side. He used the word we, and this is a component of being black in America I don't want to say globally, but let's, let's say being black in America that we have to deal with that white America doesn't understand how they separate us. Because in white America's eyes, when LeBron used the word we, they're like, you're not a part of them. You don't get hunted down every day. Yeah. And in all actuality, he does, but it's in a different way. So when they read his quote, the backlash is going to be, well, you're not them, LeBron. So now you're posturing. You're including yourself in a part of society that you don't exist in anymore. And we know there's no separation as black folks because we know how we all are treated regardless of what status of life we live in. But most of white America does not understand that. So I think what you're saying, that's really hopeful. But for the most part, I can see that falling on deaf ears because the minute he used the word we, they're going to say he included himself in that and he's not a part of what he's saying. And of course, uh, LeBron's house was vandalized a few years back. Yep. And you got like certain parasites of the sports page t saying, oh, well, that we don't really believe that happened. And it's like, you don't believe it happened because you don't want to believe it happened. Exactly. And shake your worldview. Yeah, um, because that can, that, that can happen to me. That can yeah. happen to the guy next door. But LeBron is not, he's not black. You know what I'm saying? He's not. He, 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 he's not like you all. So, yeah, that, that is the exact same belief. I'm not black. I'm OJ. Um, <laughs> to, to quote that rental James Simpson. Um, but to I wanted to ask you about a couple other folks. You have an amazing chapter in The Game is Not a Game about women's sports. Okay. That I, actually, I actually read it with my daughter. It was fantastic. It's called Them to the Unrespected Worth of the Woman Athlete. And that makes me think about... Uh, Megan Rapino and the way she has tried to link with this tradition in a way that's really interesting, right. like a way that's humble, in a way that says, I'm not leading this. I just want, you know, and as a gay American, I, I want, I know what it's like to not have my rights respected yep. as a woman making very little on the dollar that male soccer players make. I get it. And I support Colin Kaepernick and I'm going to be able to try to figure out a space where I can use my platform to show something like that. Man, let me tell you one of the things, the, the two regrets I have, I have many, but these are two just off the top of my head because you brought up Megan, um, is that one, Megan and I spent a day together in Seattle, man, um, doing part of the 
what wound up being a Kaepernick situation with Nike. And we've spent a day together and had really decent, long, you know, engaging conversations across the board wow. about where we stood as in America. So I, you know, I kind of got a decent insight on, you know, where she even privately feels about those things. And it made me, you know, respect her more. The problem that one of the regrets I have is that I have that entire conversation and could not include it in the book. Arg. There, there's three. I had a conversation with LeVar Ball, had a conversation with Charles Barkley, and had a conversation with Megan Rapino that I could not include in the book. And it, it bothered me. And the other regret I have is that had I thought and had I not write, written the book before last summer happened, I would have included Megan not only in the Dem 2 chapter, but in the whitest, white, uh, whitest woke chapter with Steve Kerr and Greg Popovich and made it a three pillar chapter instead of a two pillar chapter. Yes, yeah, she, she's a powerhouse. Yeah, she is, she is, she is. And I like the fact that, you know, she is not wavering. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that she is not wavering. And, and But, you know, in my short time of really getting to spend time with her, she doesn't seem like the person that will waver or can be shifted on her beliefs because um, like many true, true, authentic people um, that try to not think about their status in America, you know, she doesn't care what the response is because as Chuck D would say, God knows because it's coming from the heart. Because it's coming from the heart. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> See, I've got the lyric just ran through my head. Hey, right, 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 right. Exactly. Coming from the heart. Um, yep. I, I'd be remiss. Also, I mean, for goodness sakes, I mean, you're a Chicago guy to the core. And I want to ask you about uh, where Michael Jordan fits into this discussion that we're talking about, about sports, politics, activism, leveraging fame, race, yeah. racism, where Jordan fits. But first, can you tell us just, I mean, as a Chicago guy, the first time you met Michael Jordan and what your impressions were of him? Wow. First time I met Michael Jordan um, was his, man, I shook his hand and met him. Well, I'm, I'm trying to think of where I met him. I, I, you know what? First I, impression. I, I have, no, no. I happen to be, it's, it's funny because I actually meet him. I was one of the few individuals that was at that 82 game in New Orleans. In the Superdome. Really? I went to school at Xavier University in New Orleans. And my father, because the Final Four was at championship game, I don't know how my father did it, but he he found a way to get two tickets for my roommate and I to go to that game in the Superdome. So we were like way, way, way up. But, you know, we knew about Jordan, but we were at, so I won, I was at that game. And wow. of course, I was pulling for Georgetown and my roommate was pulling for North Carolina. So that's a whole nother story. Then he came here. And he played summer league basketball at Chicago State University, you know, back in the day where, you know, just it was a pro, it was our pro-am. Mm -hmm. so Michael did that. Um, I can't remember if it was before his rookie year or after his rookie year. But, you know, I, 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 I'm sure I met him at that point then. I don't, I don't know. But at some point during the course of his first three or four years, you know, I think we shook hands. But, the you know, think about it is that I – didn't mean anything to him at the time because we hadn't even started Slam Magazine. I wasn't even like official official. I was just a kid out of graduate school, you mm -hmm. know, getting my hustle on, you know. So um, it, to be honest and to really say when I shook his hand and him like, oh, you're Scoop Jackson. And I'm like, yeah, my name is Scoop Jackson. That probably came upon right on the edge of his first requirement, maybe ring three or right after that. And and what was your, I mean, once you got to actually know him beyond a handshake, what was your general impression? Well, I knew Cass and knew Mike and I knew, you know, all type of, you know, I was in his presence a lot, you know, even without even meeting him and like doing this that, and the other. And I knew the people he hung with. I knew how he carried himself, you know, and I respect the fact that he seemed extremely authentic. Like, you know, you run into a lot of people who reach a certain amount of fame. He reached fame quickly. Like he reached, people don't understand how fast he became famous. You know, they want to include that shot 
you know, in North Carolina as his introduction to the world. But hell, we've seen cats, you know, was it Chris Jennings? Who hit the last shot for Villanova? Was it Chris Jennings? Uh oh yes. Uh no, it was uh um Chris Jenkins. Chris Jenkins, right, Chris Jenkins, okay. Chris Jenkins hit the last shot to win that. We don't know who the hell he is. You know what I'm saying? He, he, his fame didn't start there. Yeah. You know, Michael Jordan fame didn't really start then. Mm-hmm. His fame really, really started when he got drafted number three behind Sam Bowie. That's radar number one. Then he introduced himself to the world during that Olympics. Mm-hmm. That's when he really started to go global. And then his first couple of games in Chicago where he really went like bananas and like, oh, this kid is real. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when you rarely get in your first week of your professional career, do you make the cover of Sports Illustrated? Yeah, Star is Born, I believe. So cover. that's when it started to really hit. So, you know, for us, it was like, oh, my God, this dude is like he's, he's you know, in Chicago, he really became special extremely, extremely quick. That being said, you know, being around him and people that I grew up with it around him, you know, because Michael really induced himself and didn't separate himself from the hood. Mm-hmm. You know, I say, I'm a black dude from Carolina. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm doing whatever the brothers do in Chicago do. So he's hanging with Quentin Daly. He's hanging with Orlando. You know, he's doing, you know, he's hanging with Rod Higgins. You know, Rod Higgins was his boy, you know, back in the day. And then, that was back in the day where there was no real, like, true celebrity kind of split. The velvet rope hadn't been invented yet. So when you went to, like, places like we used to go to, like the Charlie Club, mm-hmm. the, you know, one, one of the hot black clubs back in the day, Mike could be there. You know, Juanita would be there. The Bulls would be there. And you could just intermingle. It wasn't any, all right, man, here's the, you know, here's the VIP section. It didn't roll like that. You could go down on Rush Street and hang out where everybody walked around and kicked the, got their party on this, that, and the other. You just walked up and down Rush Street. Mike would be out there. You know, QD would be out there. The Bulls would be out there. You know, it's just, you know, blacks, they just be out. Everybody be kicking it. And Mike, for being as famous as he was and how quick he came, he never really separated himself like that. He never created a velvet rope immediately like that. So for us, we gained appreciation for that, man. Because, you know, we could have seen so easily be like, eh, y'all do your thing. I'm over here, especially with me not being from Chicago, me being Mike Jordan. I ain't from here. I don't get down with you all like that. That's not how we roll. I'm going to roll a different way. He never, ever, ever did that. So it's interesting that you say that because um, it brings me to the last dance. And, you know, the last dance gives the impression. I mean, he even tells uh, stories about it that those early years, he was just like Mr. Homebody, not doing anything. And he would walk into the hotel room and see some of the folks you mentioned. And uh, he was like walked in and then turned around and walked right out because it was too much of a scene for him. And he was just too busy thinking about his craft and thinking yeah. about what he was doing. Yeah, but he, was, he wasn't a nerd. He still hang out. But they were doing a lot of the people. I mean, let's be real. You know, that's just not just his team. That was stuff going on in professional sports anyway. Oh, yeah. And hell, don't, don't have me bring up the New York Mets. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No. Right, we, we that was my team growing up. Right, exactly, man. My team too. So I mean, you know, we can't think that it was just the, you know, the Bulls players or just the Bulls team. I'm pretty sure the Phoenix Suns, the the Nets, oh, Phoenix the Suns. Nets, you know what? Come on, man. we go down the line. Hell, we yeah. could we we could throw Lawrence Taylor's whole career in this, you know. So that was just what was going on in professional sports at the time, and what they were doing sometimes was a little bit extra for Michael. So Michael would turn away from that, but it wasn't like he was a, a herb. He wasn't just sitting up in his whole in, in his you know iron in his shorts like they showed him doing it. No, Mike would get out and like do his thing and kick it every now and then. And he he was part of whatever was going on. And he's always kind of been that way. But he went from being a part of what was going on to setting the standard. Yeah. For what was going on. And that brings me to uh to the last dance. I've got some issues with I've been very entertained by right. the last dance. Very entertained. And in the context of coronavirus. Very grateful to have something on the sports calendar to actually look forward to. Let me just say that right off. Exactly. And I do have some real issues with it, though, and some problems with it. As and I can certainly enumerate what those are. But first, I just wanted to ask you what your thoughts are about it. I feel the exact same way you do. Um, I, I'm, I, I have to separate journalists from fam when I watch this. 
you know, and I have to separate myself from being someone who was a part of that last season and the seasons leading up to that last season as a journalist, being around that team as much as I was around that team and knowing the participants, the people in there, the way that I knew them, I have to find a way to separate that and just become a fan of the docuseries itself and enjoy it for what it is and the narrative, not necessarily they're trying to shape, but the narrative they're trying to tell and the purpose of this film. So I have found a way to be able to do that and keep, you know, the other side of things where I find flaws in it to the side, you know, and I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be that, that, you know, cantankerous, you know, <laughs> you know, old, getting old man that like makes it, has a problem with everything, man. At some point we have to enjoy things for what they are and what they're trying to do. And I know The Last Dance is only trying to tell a story in actuality of, you know, what that last season was for them as a team. It's, it's not a documentary on Michael Jordan's life. It's not a documentary on, you know, whatever else we want to make it about. It's literally about that, but it uses different parts to bring back that story. You know, so I have to keep reminding myself that, huh, why aren't they going deeper here? Like, yeah, that's not a part of what this is about. You know, so I have I have to keep reminding myself and I found a way to do that and still enjoy it. To use one example, um, I, I was upset about the absence of mentioning another Haymarket Books author, actually, uh, Mr. Craig Hodges. Yeah. No, you well, know, no mention of Craig and Craig, you know, when they're doing the flashbacks and especially when they were talking about Jordan and politics, like Craig Hodges was such a unique figure in the early 90s and seeing himself in that kind of Ali tradition of saying, I'm going to use this platform to try to do something. And Craig is written out of the script. Yeah. And you know what? Here's the thing. I agree with you. And and I love Craig more than like 99% of the athletes that are walking the face of the earth right now. You know, but my, my, my takeaway from that is one, he wasn't part of that final team and everything is built around that final team. Two, Ron Harper doesn't even get mentioned. And he's a part of a big part of that. So I can't go and expect Craig, who wasn't even a part of that team, to be mentioned or highlighted. Facts. Huh? Give me some of that in the flashbacks, though, when they're talking about like the 89, 90 season, 90, 91. Give I know, but once again, it's so good on the mic, too. All of those things are connected to what's current in the storytelling. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not giving it a pass. I'm just trying to put it in connection. Like, I'm not, I understand, even if it's wrong, why someone like Craig is not included. Because I'm looking at people that are currently on this team that are not included. And, and telling the story of what that final season was like. And I'm not, you know, I, I'm being fair about all this. The fact that they haven't done really anything, really, outside of what Michael Scotty did to Tony Kukoc, they're not even talking about Tony Kukoc and his importance to this squad. Hell, a couple of years before that final season, he was sixth man of the year. Yeah, that's right. You know, so he goes almost unmentioned. So my thing is I don't take Craig's thing as personal because I'm looking at people that were currently a part of this team. And I know, I know how big of a role Ron Harper played from a basketball standpoint of them getting those last three rings. And for him not to get a mention outside of what he did in Cleveland? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> Come on. So, and, and I want to, we, we've got some questions piling up that folks have for you, but I don't want to uh, go, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about what your thoughts were um, in this continuum of people who use sports, about your thoughts about uh, Colin Kaepernick. And I guess I want to phrase the question in two parts. Like, one, what were your thoughts about Colin Kaepernick, bam, back in August 2016, right when he first took the knee? And what are your thoughts now? My first thought, and I kind of addressed it in the book, is that this is something he did silently, and this is something he necessarily didn't want to go public. Uh, we members of the media bought that public. So he took on a burden and a movement that he never asked for, you know, and the fact that he stayed true to that without saying that, well, like, Hey, hey, I ain't asked for this. You know what I'm saying? He never went that route. So I gained a certain appreciation for him not backing off because he never intended any of this to happen. He was not trying to bring attention to himself. He, he was just doing him. That's it. Right. And the spotlight fell on him. But he never shied away from that spotlight. So I gained a certain appreciation for him on that. Um, moving forward, um, 
I personally am glad that uh, he never got a chance, and I don't, and I'm saying chance very loosely. Um, let me let me change that word, Dave. He never got the opportunity to enter back into the NFL. I, I never wanted him after this entire episode to get back to the NFL. So the whole thing about Roger Goodell and other individuals trying to, you know, create an opportunity for him to showcase to get back in. I, you know, what he did, I'm cool with, but I was one that wish he would have said no from the very beginning. And I understand how much football means to him, but for what he's been through and the way he's been treated, I look at the bigger picture of this and I'm like, don't give them the luxury of being able to say, oh, we did this. We did this for you. We let you back in. Don't, don't give him that. Mm. You know, go out of this thing as a martyr. I never wanted him to give any NFL owners or the league itself an out clause in this entire story. So I'm glad that what happened with him attempting to get back in and him trying to whatever. I'm glad that I'm glad he's not back in the NFL. I hope he never gets a chance to go back in the NFL. I really do. It's interesting. I'm not not to self plug or anything, uh, but I've been no, working. You're in- I've been quarantined. I've been working on this book. I've got an idea about called the Kaepernick effect. And I've been interviewing a lot of high school, middle school and college kids who took a knee. And I don't think people even realize how deep it got, like in really small communities. Yeah. This is that got no attention. Death threats leveled at 14 year old kids. Yeah. People rolling up with Confederate flags and guns because a cheerleader takes a knee in upstate New York. Like so many stories. Right. Uh, how people were influenced by this one gesture because they really felt like they had to do something but didn't know what something was. And then they I, see it and say, I can do that. But here's the thing, Dave, and that's all well and good, but still, a brother can't take a jog in Georgia yeah. without getting rifled down and without us having to sign petitions to get an investigation to get those people arrested. You know what I'm saying? So you can take all that taking the knee. It's all symbolic. It's all good and cute. But that doesn't change the fact that what Colin Neal for in the beginning. And situations like we're living in right now is what this thing is all about and always has been about. Yeah. And yet we're still here. So. No, you're right. And um, shout out to the brave people, both in Georgia and in Indianapolis, where a young man named Sean Reed was was gunned down. They're out there protesting in the middle of a pandemic, wearing masks trying to stay six feet apart and what kind of, I mean, forced out of their house to do this. And it's not going to get one tenth of the coverage of the Confederate waving gun toting Michigan protesters or anything like that. And these are folks really risking their health because they feel like they have no choice but to be heard. I mean, it's really something. Yeah. it is. Um, is. Let me ask you some questions. Yes, sir. I got some great questions. Um, I got I got to run through these uh, Billy Jones questions because he's got some great ones. Okay. First, which book has changed the way you thought the most? Alex Haley's book, um, not not Roots, but the book he did with all of the interview. Alex Haley's interviews. Alex Haley interviewed um, a lot of the prominent social socially responsible individuals in America during his time with Playboy magazine. Mm. Um, and I was, that's, you know, you know, people say they read Playboy, you know, for whatever, you know, but Alex Haley was that writer because he interviewed JFK, he interviewed Malcolm X, he interviewed Martin Luther King, he interviewed, uh, matter of fact, his interview in Playboy magazine started, was a springboard to Malcolm X's autobiography. Yeah. But somehow they put up, they put all his interviews in Playboy magazine in a collective. And I think it was called Alex Haley, the interviews. Wow. And I read them as I was coming up independently, but Dave, you know, as a writer, reading things collectively consolidated as opposed to spread out over years changes the entire digestion of what you just read. It's kind of like listening to, you know, somebody's, career musically over the course of their entire career and then getting that box set and listening to that box set in one setting. It changes everything. So the one book to answer that question was Alex Haley's Playboy interviews. That 
changed everything for me as a grown individual. Wow. Great answer. Uh, it's so interesting because so many people, when they're asked that question, say autobiography of Malcolm X. And when you said Alex Ailey, that's where I thought you were starting. But right. then you took it to something much more expansive than that. Yeah, because it was every, it was everybody that was in there. And his his as a journalist, his question, not only his question asking, but what he was able, the answers he was able to get out of these individuals that nobody was able to get. Mm -hmm. you know, it was it was amazing to me to read all that and what I learned about those people and what I learned about journalism, you know, and what I learned about question asking and what I learned about like not interviewing people, but holding conversations. All of that came from that book. Brilliant. Um, uh, another question. I got to go through my Billy Jones questions. He he because he's referencing directly chapter 12 in the game is not a game, which is okay. such a good book. And the chapter is called The Numb in Numbers. Mm. And it's a critique of analytics uh, and what analytics have done to sports. And he says, Billy says, I get your point, but do you feel that analytics takes away the soul, spirit, emotion, and intensity from the game? I think it does from a professional level. Um, and I understand that when we're dealing with professional sports, and I'm including college sports in there because they are professional operation for, for you know, at some point of sports because of the money that it generates. So it'd be foolish to look at them as anything but professional. You know, so I include them in there. But I, I do think at some point it takes away from the freedom that sports gives on a professional level because the professional level of sports is about winning. It's a winning business. So, you know, and I understand that, but I do feel at this point in time, because of how important and how relevant you know, analytics has been not just from a consumer standpoint, but from a functional standpoint, as far as coaches and scouts and, you know, you know, video, you know, and, and execution that there are there's a component that has softened a lot of the creativity and freedom that we've allowed ourselves to fall in love with when it comes to sports. And from the athlete directly doing things as a reaction, as opposed to just a thought. So, yeah, yes, I, you know, I, I do believe that. And once again, I've never said that analytics is all wrong. I said all analytics are wrong. You know, I think there's room for both of these to be coexisting in professional sports at, at this period of time. But it seems to be. All on one, you know, it, it's, it's, it's all or nothing, you know, and I'm looking at the role sports is played, especially for, you know, African-Americans and black individuals in America and what that means beyond just the, the, the functionality of sports on the field of play or on the court. And how that, including analytics and giving it so much power, takes away from everything sports has meant to us. You see, well done for us. I'll put it that yeah. way. Yeah, and Howard Bryant um, has a great piece up. I put it on my Twitter feed at Edge of Sports where he talks about how this period of coronavirus, he just this post was published today, has had him watching a lot of classic games and had him thinking about like, wow, like it really was different the way it was broadcast, the way it was brought to you, the way people played without being so hung up on those front office details of analytics. Yeah. I think the, the, it's very interesting. A lot of analytics I find fascinating. To me, the worst part is that it, it puts the, um, the viewer in the position of thinking like they're a front office person, and it puts the broadcaster like they're some front office person crunching the numbers instead of just immersing yourself in the joy of play. Exactly. Exactly. Now, now, let's take that back. And how do you think that affects the athlete as they're out there on the field? If they keep if they keep getting this information poured into them and this is the way it needs to happen. Oh, wildly. I right. Mean, you better jack up 43s in a game or else we'll be low on our analytical breakdown of or, three point shot. Right. Or, or, or like I'm not going to take this shot because it's going to affect you know, my percentages, it's going to bring down this. It, this is not, it may be a smart shot, but I'm being taught now, this is not a good shot. 
you know, and I, the one thing I tried to do in that chapter is separate basketball from all of the other sports that use analytics because I think basketball, and I'll include soccer in this, are such immediate reactionary sports that it's hard to include that type of data as being at the forefront of how this sport should function and move. You know, baseball is extremely strategic and basically built off statistics. Football is extremely st strategic and less built off of data the way baseball is, but it's still strategic in movement and plays and this, that, and the other. Basketball and, like I said, soccer, they, you know, you do what the defense gives you. You react to what's right in front of you. Um, and it doesn't lend itself for you to think numbers and four or five plays or movements ahead of time in order to make this thing work a certain way because this is where I'm taught it's supposed to work from our video coordinator to our assistant coach who wants this data executed. Yeah. You know, it, it, it just doesn't lend itself to that the way it does with other basketball and soccer. I don't believe lend themselves to an ad analytic platform the way other sports can lend themselves to. So in the chapter, I specifically use basketball, specifically. And then I get on us in the media how we apply analytics to tell stories and we leave so much out yeah. uh, when we're stressing certain data of why certain things happen. Well put, indeed. And uh, the one last question here is, uh, if you had the power to change the sports and entertainment industry, you got 24 hours to really change things. What what do you do? Put more women's sports on. Yeah. That's all. Yeah, I, I, I really think that's a problem. And I think we, in, in our male, in our toxic male-dominated society, especially at the expense of those who control, you know, sports, um, especially the, the, the media side of sports, we miss out on not only just the performance of what women do, but the greatness that women bring to the table when it comes to competition. Um, so I would find a way to, you know, highlight that a lot more and make it become normal mm -hmm. instead of like, you know, something that's ancillary. Yeah, th there's a great sports writer, Lindsay Gibbs. Uh, her her columns are under the headline of power plays, and she had this argument that said, "How could it? How would it change the sports world for the better if, when sports come back, you give women's sports just like a week before men's sports just come like trampling in, just a week, so everybody who's starved for sports can tune in and see, you know, Diana Taurasi and see Brianna Stewart and Elena Della Don and and see." Uh, all these amazing athletes, uh, soccer, all of it, and just imbibe it, take it in, see it for what it is. Yeah, but here's the thing, man. Then, then, then you're gonna have a Black History Month all over again. And then the <laughs> no. lot of, right, and a lot of things, what, what is that really doing? You know, they, you know, to me, they just deserve to be put. It'd be nice to use a week as an introduction, but then continue that and just make it just normal. You know, just make it part of the regular influx of how we digest sports in this country and you know we all talk about this equality and diversity and all this and the other but you know when 80 percent of the sports we watch or are being told to watch or being a, you know having the ability to watch is male sports and you know women represent a much smaller 20 percent of that that's not equality you know what i'm saying so it's we're missing out on a lot we are no doubt and as someone who lives in dc and I uh, got to see the Washington Mystics roll to a championship. I mean, it was a lot of fun. Elena, Elena Deladon and Christy Tolliver, baby. Yeah, Christy Tolliver. Oh, my God. Girl. Like, the idea that people would consciously opt out of having fun Yeah, is just so maddening to me. And it speaks to the sexism of which you're talking about. But here's the thing. And I kind of deal with this in the book. We also, those who champion women's sports and understand the importance of women's sports, we're still not doing our part on our regular normal basis by incorporating them into what we do on our regular basis. And mm -hmm. I said, look, I watched the WNBA finals, but I wasn't having like a bunch of the fellas come over. Hey, we need to get together the same way I would if it was the NBA finals. 
I'm not watching, you know, you know, I'm not watching Wimbledon or, you know, uh, or, you know, the U.S. women's soccer team. The same way I'm watching the U.S. men's basketball team and my engagement and like not just my personal, but the engagement around me while I'm rallying. Hey, man, let's go to the bar and watch this. You know, I'm not rallying like, you know, we do around a football game. Like, hey, man, let's go to the bar and watch, you know, the Chiefs play the Rams. Mm-hmm. Let's do that. No, but, you know, why not? Why wouldn't we do that? Why aren't we doing that when it comes to the NBA Finals? Why aren't I like, hey, Dave, you know what, man? Let's, let's hook up and go to the bar and, you know, go watch this game. And when we get to the bar, they're not showing it, the man that they show it on the screen. Mm-hmm. We're not, so even as we champion this, we're still not doing this on a regular basis, which is considered our normal when it comes to things we do for male sports. So we're just as bad as everybody else to a certain degree as far as I'm concerned. Well, we all have to um, think of ways that we can correct our approach for the purposes of promoting what is, I think, really important. I think you're absolutely right about that. Packy Moran has an interesting question for you. Um, how useful is the W.E.B. Du Bois Booker T. Washington argument? And, you know, that's about political versus economic activism as, right. as a way to move against racism, of course. How useful is that? template to understand the LeBron James, Michael Jordan duality? That's a great question. I think we're living in a day and age right now where at some point you need both. You know, Du Bois was spectacular in talking about the duality uh, that African Americans and blacks in this country have to live in and have to exist in um, when he talked about the souls of black folks in 1903. So he broke that down in a way that still is prominent to this day and we still have to function with you know mr washington was on something else because he strictly built a lot of what he was doing on the economic side of what black people have to amass in order to find some type of leverage in this country and he had a, a view of how important economics was in america i look at both of them and understand the root of what they were getting at and the roles they play today but I don't hold, once again, each individual accountable to do everything in those roles. I don't ask Michael Jordan to be as socially outspoken as LeBron James while he's handling things economically for black individuals that no other Fortune 100, no other Fortune 500, no other, you know, franchise in sports is doing when it comes to hiring and placing black executives in roles that black people won't even look at and the power of having that ownership and what it means to at least see a black male in America amass not only a billion dollars but becoming a billionaire in a society and a country that economics is first and foremost. Mm -hmm. I understand the power that actually has. Because guess what? Take him out of that conversation, and where are we? You know, and we look at sports as black individuals and the role is played in emancipating and liberating us in this country, or more than that, normalizing us in white America. Look at the role that sports has played in normalizing black individuals. I mean, in all honesty, I'm not trying to be flippant or funny, but hell, before Jack Johnson and Joe Lewis, we were still considered three-fifths human beings. Yeah. They actually made, they gave us, sports gave black people in this country the other two-fifths. Now, you keep that in in mind, and one of the only three black billionaires we have in this country is somebody who did it through sports. So if you take that aspect out of this conversation, what role does sports really have for us in America without somebody amassing some type of ownership, some type of billionaire status. You know what I'm saying? So I understand the importance of that. So I'm not going to look at Mike to be a social activist. I understand the role he plays. And I understand the role he plays in giving LeBron a path to follow. He didn't have to necessarily have to follow that straight path, but he could follow part of that path and still have and be socially conscious to put out messages that are going to resonate beyond the money he's going to be able to amass. Now, at the same time, I'm not expecting LeBron James to be Craig Hodges. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I think 
it goes back to what I was saying about absolute blackness. I think at this point, what Du Bois and Washington were talking about back in the day, we have existing right now, but I see a balancing act going on across the board where everything they spoke about is in parts of the individuals who are at the top of the food chain, chain from an athletic standpoint in both socialism and economics. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting indeed. Um, you know, and I've had my <laughs> critiques of Jordan over the years, but when every time people ask about him speaking out, I always want to ask, are you speaking out? And why right. do we ask of athletes what we don't ask of ourselves? Exactly. And it's the Superman syndrome where you expect somebody to come down from planet awesome to lead the way. And some of that comes out of people's desperation to see social change and not knowing how it happens. But it also comes from a misreading of history. Like, you know, if the 1950s and 60s don't happen. If if Malcolm X doesn't happen, then we're not talking about Muhammad Ali. You don't have that poster behind you. Exactly. But people are a function of their times and, exactly. and the soil in which they grow. And we have exactly. to respect that process. Exactly. And, and, and let's be honest, Dave, you and I have been through this. We were existing maybe starting eight or nine years ago, maybe further back, maybe 10, but let's say eight or nine years ago, where there seemed to be a large, you know, generation of apathy. Yeah. You know, when it came to athletes, you know, um, and, you know, them using their voice to speak their opinion. And a lot of it could have been connected to economics yeah. or you know, the, the economics that wouldn't be afforded to them had they used their voice to say something or whether they were feeling a certain way. And when we're dealing with black America during that time period, we're talking about, you know, the, 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 the post Ali pre Maya Moore, let's go that way. Mm -hmm. the, you know, post Ali pre Maya Moore generation of athletics where what am I going to be charged with if I do say something? But here's the thing. I'm as an athlete feeding all society and society is apathetic also. Yeah. <laughs> They're not saying anything. There was no quote unquote black power, militant, political, socially active movement going on in society as it pertained to minorities. The same way it was, like you said, what, what ended in the 70s. Through the 80s, the 90s, and the early 2000s, there was no quote-unquote movement. So athletes and, behaved the way society was behaving, which tends to be, as you said, the truth. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, and the few athletes who did try to keep that flame alive. Um, exactly. Craig Hodges, Mahmoud abdul Rauf, uh, they found themselves on the other end of the boot. And, uh, and it, it, that, that is part of, of, of labor discipline, you know, yeah. trying to say – you know, you're not allowed to do this. And that's the thing about Kaepernick, too, is that he has so much more value to the NFL as like a ghost story to say, yeah, don't do what he did or else you'll find yourselves on the way out uh, than he did as a player. Like that yeah. was true value to the NFL. It was as a form of labor and racial discipline. In communication theory, we call this the spiral of silence. Mm. You say something in society through the media, for the most part, has the power to spiral you into silence. We saw Craig Hodges go through that. We saw Mamou Adur Aru go through that. You know, we see many athletes go through that where they make a statement, but they're on such an island by themselves. Right. At the time that they did it, that, you know, from a media standpoint and from a, basically from a business standpoint because of the leagues that they function in, were able to make them seem like they were the, you know, they were the, they were not the rule. They were not the norm. They were the outcasts, mm -hmm. you know, um, and their voices became quieter and quieter and quieter because we were almost instructed not to rally around them mm -hmm. because there wasn't, you know, there was no galvanization around what they were saying. They were all alone. But now we're in a situation where if LeBron or Steph Curry or like I said, Maya Moore or Reagan Rap Rapinoe, if they want to say something, are rallying around him. Colin Kaepernick came at the right time because he wasn't, he wasn't, they weren't able to isolate him. Yeah. Because there was a quote unquote mini movement that existed where he was going to be able to find support regardless of the direction the media wanted to take his story and regardless of the way the NFL or other sports leagues wanted to take his story. 
And it, it's about being able to have outlets to communicate your ideas as well uh, through social media. Because I remember interviewing a lot of <laughs> athletes like 15 years ago who were against Bush and against the war and outraged by Hurricane Katrina, all of these emotions. And I said to them, why don't you speak out about this? You know, people want to hear your voice. And their answer was, have you ever looked at the sports media? Yeah. There are not a lot of people who I can talk to who I feel like will even tell my story. Yeah. And wh what's the point of talking to them if I'm just going to get crushed for doing it? And here's the deal. Even if, they're, if they had individuals in sports, journalists that they could come to, like you, about, you or I, they, we were going we to find a wall trying to tell that story as well. Exactly. Um, and I remember you wrote an article a long time ago about being in a room with uh, other journalists and you being the only one who had editorial power over what you were writing. Yeah. You remember writing that, but it was it made a real strong impression on me as a young person that a couple of black journalists were there and they came up to you and they were like, hey, you're the only one who, get, who gets to actually see what you write. And that's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's funny because it's a good thing for you, but for me, it was, it's, it's, it's a sad thing because you look around the room and you see other inv individuals like yourself that are working at places that, you know, apparently you should want to go. Yes. And, you know, you're like, damn, do I really want to go there? And, you know, what, 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 is, what is the true definition of power or having power if I'm at this small entity, but I have juice and going where they are and being juice less, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. It became where, where you take it as like, yo, that's, that's a cool thing. I was, it was kind of sad for me. No, no, no. I just thought the column was cool because <laughs> I remember it 20 years later, <laughs> but just the writing stayed with me. Now, there um, you go. That's my job though. That's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Your writing is sticky in that it sticks in the brain. Um, Betty Forrester has this question. I've got my own answer to this. It relates to so much we've been talking about, but she wants to know, has the NFL crushed the movement within the league that Colin Kaepernick and Eric Reed sparked, or is it just on the DL? I'll let you answer first. All right. See, my, my take on it is that this is so dependent on the movement and the cases that are going on outside the league. I think that you're not going to see much uh, if the NFL exists in a kind of a vacuum. But if we start seeing, and we are seeing it, we talked about Ahmed Arbery before, we talked about Sean Reed before. I mean, if we start seeing these cases uh, pop and people start getting angry, I think that there is a pipeline that now exists between the people and the players that didn't exist before. And so it's something that you could see reviving again uh, but it's not going to revive itself in a vacuum. You know, it's like the old expression. You've got the steam and you've got the motor. You know, you got to have both the steam and the motor for the motor to run. Yeah, I see that. I see that. Here's my thing. The way I look at it is this way. Is that let's see if Arthur Blank, who uh, is the owner of the Atlanta Falcons, and that happened in his backyard. Yes. If he, if he does anything... If he speaks out, supports the family, if they, if the petition doesn't get signed, he's out there marching. If him as an NFL owner does anything in this movement, then I'll, I mean, in this certain situation, then I'll say yes. Uh, Colin and what Air Reader fighting for will, you know, is it, not dead in the NFL because that's basically what they're trying to call to action. Mm. Is the larger party in NFL ownership, you know? at least acknowledge ex what is going on and act like, oh, well, you know, that, that's not even an issue with us. So let's see. Cause that, cause if you had, once again, the kneeling was about injustice, human injustice to people of color, specifically black people at the hands of police officers. In this case is those that have guns mm. or those that don't look like us that have guns or Things that happen to us because we are black. You know, that's what this entire movement was all about. But because it happened inside the constructs of the NFL, because it happened on the NFL's time, it became an NFL issue. So where Colin and Ed Reed may have been trying to voice something louder outside of the NFL, 
I think their mission was to see if anybody inside of the NFL heard them. And once again, let's use our current situation. If a man's situation goes on and Arthur Blank with the Falcons contributes in some way, uses his voice, or just say, hey, the Atlanta Falcons as an organization will not stand for this. If he puts the Atlanta Falcons seal on that petition, then, hey, it's worth it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You, you, you would be able to not knock me over with a feather if that happens. I, I would like to see that happen. Um, I feel like the NFL is almost distinct from other sports that we watch and love. And that th- there is an entrenched... There is an entrenched soul of racism in the National Football League because they're in tr- like just in part of the sport is that you're looking at black bodies like they're disposable. Yeah. And that whole NFL stands for not for long. And then that filters its way up. So there are only three black coaches right now in the National Football League. That's how many there were when the Rooney Rule uh, whole lawsuit thing that Johnny Cochran tried to push in the first place. It was three. That was the crisis point 20 years ago was three. Yeah, And it's three again. I mean, and the amount of executives is, I, th- I think, even lower than three at this point. It's one or two. And and obviously, we talked about there being no ownership. And I, I, it's hard to separate that absence of representation in positions of power with how the players are treated on the field itself and how disposably they're treated in the game. Yeah. And, and you look at my whole thing is focusing on, like, the position of running back. And um, running back being a predominantly position held by black individuals in this game and how disposable they have really become, you know, yes. in football. A 26 and, over the and, hill. <laughs> and wait, and that could be part of my argument towards the power and the issues I have with analytics. Because they look at, they'll use that. Well, analytically, you know, running the football over the course of this doesn't look free well. So basically, you're basically just... Ex, you know, exercising the right to eliminate an entire role of football from a fullback and a running back standpoint where 99% of those players are black. Mm-hmm. If I wanted to go there, I could go there. I'm not saying I'm going there. I'm just saying it lends itself for me to go there, you know, and, 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 and have these thoughts, you know. So to what you said is that, but I'll go deeper to how it affects everything on the field. Yeah. No, that's that's real talk right there. And that, the racial that, trickle-down theory. The racial trickle-down theory, I'll call it. Or uh, doc, Dr. Harry Edwards says something similar, which he calls it the the black athletes, the canary in the coal mine. Like when, when you start to die off, be, <laughs> be Dave, careful and get but, ready. But Dave, you make a good point. I mean, you could say there's there's three black coaches, but to, for me as a black individual, you know, I've heard this conversation a lot. We shouldn't just stop at the coaching situation like it's the answer. You know, there, there's so many other roles within the NFL and other major sports, but since we talk about the NFL and coaches, there's so many other roles that, you know, we are qualified for and should be prominent in, you know, to reflect our impact and intellect in this sport that we are not even a part of. So I'm not saying I hate the conversation to stop at coaches. Mm. I just don't want the conversation to stop at coaches. Because to me, if we continue to stop it right there, that means when there are 11 black coaches, you know, instead of three, then everything's all good. No, it's not all good. Mm-hmm. It's not all. It's the same thing I said about Colin Kaepernick. If a team ever took him back into the league, it's like if a team ever took Colin Kaepernick back, and this part of the reason I never wanted to go back. If a team took him back, there would be this whole kumbaya situation where. Oh, he's back in the league. Everything's all good. No. One team took him. There's still 29 others that didn't. There's a problem. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, Jamel Hill uh, had that great line where she said in 20 years, the NFL is going to be giving out the Colin Kaepernick Social Justice Award as if none of this ever happened. Uh, I, I can see that happening. But the problem is, if they do it, will we fall for it? That's the question. It's the eternal question. Yep. I, I know this isn't a podcast or anything, but we actually have a request uh, from someone who clearly listened to you on my podcast, Edge of Sports, because I always, I mean, we're just about at the end of time, and I always ask you what kind of music you're listening to these days, because you've got such a mind for music. 
Right. And I was hoping you could share with us some of what's getting you through quarantine on a musical tip. Well, I've been basically taking deep dives into uh, DJ sets on Mixcloud, to be honest with you, that basically spin soulful, tribal house music. So, I yeah, I've been like, and I've been doing that for the last couple of years, but since quarantine has been around, I've really, really just gone to Mixcloud and look for various DJs across the world, you know, who was basically spinning African rooted tribal soulful house music, you know, and I don't want to start rolling off like different DJs, you know, off the top of my head. Cause I don't want to say something to miss somebody else, but you know, there, there've been a plethora of those I've been just going to every day. It's a, every day. It's a different, you know, journey, you know, tribally through house music that I've been going through deep, um, through, um, through the quarantine. But here's the thing, outside of that though, did you under, did you realize that they put out a track list for the last dance? They did? It is so dope. Of course it is. The soundtracks it is so, so that's what I've been, for the last two days, I've been going through the playlist that associates itself with the docuseries. It is ridiculously dope. Is it up on SoundCloud? Where, where yeah, on? So I got it on Spotify. Up on Spotify. All right. Yeah, it's Fantastic. On Spotify. Fantastic. I could listen to Black Sheep all day. So And Black Sheep Tribe. They even got some common in there, some LL, some, you know, some Nas, some Wu Tang. Some Beastie you know, Boys. Beastie Boys up in there. Yeah, man. It's 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 and and the curation is like really, really dope. I think it's like maybe 45 songs, maybe. Wow. It's dope, man. It's dope. That that's been my last two days. I've had that on repeat. Last two days. That sounds good to me. The book is the game is not a game. Any last words you want to say about the book, Scoop? No, nah, man, not at all. N not not about the book. I think the book speaks for itself. I'm glad I was able to get it out. Um, 19 years in the making, two years to write. I want to say something about the book then, because you won't. We will have such a better, not just sports world, but real world. If people take the time to read this and listen to what Scoop is trying to say, purchase this not just for yourself, but for that niece or nephew that you have out there uh, who you who is into sports, doesn't quite see all the connections and how it all works together. Get this for them as well. So buy a copy for yourself, buy five more copies and give away to people that you care about and love. It is an act of love to share this book. I appreciate it. Thank you. And, and what doesn't make sense now, I hope it makes sense 20 years from now. So that's my that's my hope. <laughs> all you can hope that's all i can hope that's all you can hope scoop scoop jackson thank you thank you so much for taking the time anytime day can i give one shout out real quick before we go oh yes and then i gotta read some closing thing too so please give your shout please. out i want to give a shout out to my son and my niece my son rakim and my niece hannah i'm wearing my temple hat today because today was actually their graduation from temple university oh wow we were, supposed to be, we were supposed to be in Philadelphia on this day celebrating the graduation. But, of course, the situation didn't allow that and graduation canceled. But I at least want to give them a shout out, you know, because, you know, hey, finishing college is a big, big deal. And I'm proud of both of them. So I'm, I'm, I'm repping Temple right now for a reason. Yeah. Wow. I, I'm I a proud parent. Proud in the atmosphere. Yeah, proud parent. You know, you know how proud fathers are. You know, we, we up there. <laughs> I'm proud of my son, uh gets off his machine and does some of this remote homework that his teachers are piling on. <laughs> um, so, yo, I just want to remind folks about two upcoming events. On May 14th, Haymarket hosts another Chicago person, Eve L. Ewing and Jen Johnson, who will discuss what school means and how we radically re re can reimagine the meaning of public schools with an anti-racist, liberatory vision of what education could be. If you've never seen Eve Ewing, just trust me, May 14th, you want to be there. May 19th, Haymarket hosts Abolish ICE is not just a slogan, immigrant justice in the age of coronavirus. Uh, thank you, Scoop. Before we close, I want to remind people that if you're in a position to make a donation, no matter how small, please consider giving to Haymarket through Venmo and haymarketbooks.org. Thanks to Haymarket Books. Thanks to everyone who joined this call from all over the world. We hope to see you soon at Haymarket Books live streams. And thank you, Scoop. You are, as we say, a mensch. 
my man David, it was an honor. You know, you know how I feel about you, and trust me, uh, this uh, this probably means more to me than it means to you because you were able to do this and you decided to do this with me, man. I really appreciate it, partner. Oh man, my heart's going boom, boom. So yo, be well, Scoop. All right, man. Be well, my man. Peace out, everybody.